Most bankers aren't ready to help you until after their third cup of coffee. But with Central National Bank's after-hours service, you don't have to wait for the bank lobby to open to get help. You can contact us from 6 to 8.30 in the morning or from 5 to 10 in the evening, and we'll connect you to a real, live, local person who can answer questions and fix problems seven days a week. Bank different. Bank central. Central National Bank. Member FDIC. The Vietnam War, it's over. Your job just begun. A new HBO original limited series. Welcome to the world of spycraft. Strap in. From executive producers Park Chan-wook and Robert Downey Jr. What are you concealing? Based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel by Viet Thanh Nguyen. What if I told you that I was a communist spy? How did you become this? The Sympathizer, streaming April 14th on Max. Subscription required. Hey there, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to... Uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt, please be on our show. I'm sorry, I paused a little bit there. I um, I just told Allison this is one of the most challenging things I do every week. Um, it's uh, not even that bad. I feel it's like I feel like I'm on this emotional roller coaster. That um, I really want Jennifer Love Hewitt to call into our show at two five four three hundred seven nine eight two, or come by and see us at eleven twenty nine Webster Avenue in Waco, Texas, or send us an email at info at roguemedianetwork.com. Having said that, um, I'm starting to question myself as to whether <laughs> this is worth it or not. Well, we're already, what, six episodes in? Seven. 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 <laughs> we're, we're Seven. What's feels that, like. What's that thing you always tell me? Uh, every podcast. Dear God, ma- help. <laughs> No, every <laughs> podcast makes it. Before they die, makes it to uh, seven. Yeah, Seven's yeah, the magic it's number, it's right? Pod fade. Yeah, this would be the one that would kill me. <laughs> um, so we are on Ghost Whisperer season one, episode seven. Uh, it's just called Hope and Mercy. Um, it's exactly what Mike needs. What well, exactly? I need what some you hope need. and mercy after this. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the first week that I printed out the entire script, um, and I made some notes as we go. So I'm gonna. I'm going to shuffle through this sucker <laughs> so, that, so that we can get you, to... Uh, are you that tired of this? Oh, I'm not... I don't know. I don't know what it... Like I say, I think it's, it's, it's this roller coaster that I'm on, right? I mean, I'm like, oh, my God, we're going to do this show. It's going to be great. We're going to talk to General Love Hewitt. And then I am start watching the episodes, and I'm like, oh, my God, there's this slog that I'm getting through. And hopefully, you know, it bottoms out, and then I get to the another peak, right? I mean, because that would be the hope, that you get to another peak after this, and then... <laughs> I think at you're this able point to make it to the end and your keys don't fall out during the loop. You I know? think at this point we've just plateaued. Um, I think that's assuming there was a plateau that we, we plateaued. Um, I'm not sure that there was a plateau. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So this one starts with a uh, scary ambulance, um, uh, uh, coming around the bend there. Um, and we, there's been a wreck, correct? <laughs> yeah. Am I starting this right? <laughs> So there's been a there's been a very bad wreck, um, and the ambulance is there. And Jim, of course, being the EMT that he is, uh, he is there uh, picking people up in the ambulance. Uh, we do see the uh, Melinda kissy face photo up in the uh, the visor, so we know it's Jim out on duty. Um, and they are uh, picking up somebody. They say uh, they're en route of uh, the twenty to thirty year old male. He's got tattoos all over him. Uh, obvious right femur fracture. He's got a puncture from a broken bone. You know, all of this stuff, right? Uh, and they're about 15 minutes out, says Bobby, who is driving the ambulance. I'm just saying 15 minutes is a long way from a hospital, right? I mean, I mean wouldn't you think the ambulances would have to stay closer than 15 minutes away? I mean, somebody's going to die in 15 minutes, right? I mean, I guess. I mean, it's just if you're in a small town, I guess you have to 
pick up more area. Like, I, well, I guess because if right. you think yeah. about it, like if you go somewhere yeah. like Bruceville, Eddie, they probably don't have like a hospital and the closest one to them is probably us yeah and they're about 30 45 minutes yeah that's true okay all right i'm wrong about that i just i guess i'm grasping at straws at this point (laughs) looking for anything um so uh what happens is the tire blows out on the ambulance and they flip and roll and all this stuff and uh, there's been a serious crash now mr tattoo is just kind of hanging there bleeding (laughs) <laughs> uh, because the ambulance is upside down. I also don't understand how this is even that way. What do you mean? Because if you're on a stretcher, yeah, they're on wheels, right? There's nothing for the wheels yeah, but to it's click strapped onto. In. Like I think they click it into the into the ambulance or something. That I didn't have a, necessarily a problem with. I I get it. And I understand that the other two guys are kind of thrown around because they're just, you know, helping or whatever. But anyway, they, they, they roll and they flip and all this stuff. And then some guy pulls up in his car and sees the accident and he calls 911. Uh, we, we do have a location. Um, so at some point we're going to have to like build a map or something of this <laughs> show because uh, we've been given the address of, oh my God, it's old or whatever the antique store is called. Uh, and, uh, then I think we've been given, we know where Andrea lives cause we've been given her address yes. cause uh, watery girl tried to kill herself. So in later seasons, yeah, there is a map that really? comes up. In fact, there's two maps. Oh, see, maybe you're helping me get over this plateau now. Then. There is actually two maps that come up Ooh. in the series. And this is because of some other stuff. Okay. But it's feeling a little like national treasure at this point, right? Yeah, so it's it's okay. kind of it's that same vibe, but yes, there is a map that gets involved at some point. So we find out that this is Brad Paulson who's calling the nine one one operator, uh, and he's on Forest Road. He's two miles north of Stony Brook, whatever the hell that is. Is that that's not the town they live in, is it? No, I okay. think what is it like? They live in Happyville or something, Grand right? View, or, is it Grand, Grand Maybe View? it's Grand View. Grand View, Grand View, something, something like that. Sure. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's Ghostville. <laughs> um, so the, the 911 operator says, are you injured? No, 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 This ambulance is upside down, blah, blah, blah. So they're going to send the thing. Okay, great. Uh, and then we go to the night at uh, Melinda's house, and she is uh, – um, She's receiving a phone call middle of the night. I'm assuming she's asleep. He's doing an overnight gig or whatever. Uh, and they call her and say, Melinda Gordon and the Mercy Hospital. Jim's been in a wreck, blah, blah, blah. She squeals out, you know, in her tires and stuff. And that, that's great. That happens, right? And then as she's driving, we get a flashback with those damn flashes. Those, those things, right? <laughs> um, and then we see a very sexy food fight. That she's remembering. <laughs> this is the thing she remembers about Jim. If he dies, she just remembers rubbing whipped cream on his face. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> I just, well, I wrote down flashing flashbacks and sexy food fight is what I wrote down about that. Uh, she gets to the hospital and uh, they say that Jim's going to be okay. Uh, she was so afraid. Uh, and then all of a sudden, ghost girl, here she is. She shows up, right? She says, wait a minute, you can see me. I need your help, please. My husband needs your help. Okay. So what I've done is I've gone through here and I've highlighted all the ghost <laughs> whenever the ghost speaks. So it's highlighted in orange. Um, so anyway, they they she finds out that, that Jim's going to be okay and that this dude, Brad, called 911 and she sees him and all. We find out that Brad is Ghost Girl's husband. Husband, yeah. yeah. Uh, she says, you, you need to help him. She's desperate, right? And then we get... Uh, then, then it goes to the credits, right? Now it's opening. Yes, yes. So I got a question for you. Um, when the sh- before the show starts, we always see the grandma taking her up to the dead guy, right? Yes. I'm Melinda Gordon, and I see ghosts. You know that thing, right? Uh-huh. I wear a size nine, and I love <laughs> long walks on the beach, nice. or whatever she says, right? <laughs> and then, and then we have the opening credits. Also, has this always been the case? Have I just not played paid attention to this? It's always been separate. It's it's, yeah, it's essentially like... So it's basically two openings, right? Yes. It's kind of okay. like a... Can you tell me why she rips her head in half in the in the credits? I don't know. Everything's like a paper doll or whatever, and then you see a picture of her and she rips her own head in half. 
That. I thought that was a little weird. One thing that always trips me up about it is the girl in the yellow dress. Mm. If you look at it, it's yeah. bees. Oh, yeah. Her it, dress is made the, out of bees? Yeah, her dress Why? is. Why? I, I Does that ever show up? No. Is there ever a bee girl? No, nowhere in the show. Like, I mean, it's a little okay. hints, but like if you. Hints of bees? No, because well, wasn't it one that last episode he got stung by I lo- bees? I love that uh, that uh, uh, so, scent from Bath and Body Works, uh, <laughs> scent of bees. It's very, mmm, smells like honey and despair. It's very good. <laughs> yes, yes, the dude hit the hit the beehive that was literally a hornet's nest, uh, but hit it and he got attacked by bees and that's how he died. <laughs> yes. Hey, by the way, uh, uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt, if you want to be part of this debacle, uh, you can get a hold of us at 254-300-7982. I would love to talk to you about your uh, experiences working on this B-themed show. Um, So we get away from the credits, and we're in the hospital hallway, and Bobby tells uh, Melinda that he was driving and uh, says that he's fine. They had a blowout. He couldn't do anything. Ghost girl shows up again and says, hello, I need your help. I need a husband right now. If it wasn't for me, you, your husband may not be alive. So basically she's saying, hey, you owe me because my husband saved your husband, you know, by calling 911. In my notes, I have ghost is being very annoying and bothering <laughs> Melinda in she, her very tough she, time. She is, she is very <laughs> annoying. That's true. Yes. So we go to Jim's hospital room and the, the monitor's beeping. And then uh, he goes, Oh, am I dead? And then they both have a hearty laugh, which is <laughs> that was a little weird. Uh, and so she says, no, you know, and she walked away without a scratch that Bobby did. And then he's asked about the patient. Um, and uh, then he's very sad when she just goes, Jim, and never tells him what happened. Can I just say my notes are very bad. I put Jim asks about patient and his partner. Patient is dead. <laughs> like that's all I put. So I you, okay. You think your notes are bad? Here's what mine says: Jim has a big boo boo on his head. <laughs> that's what I wrote. So Melinda gets in bed with Jim in the damn hospital, which is stay off of him. You don't even know what the hell's wrong with him. And then she tries to be all sweet. Oh, sorry. When she yeah. felt like she's being too. Oh, sorry. Rough. I rolled over your broken femur. Uh, so the ghost is in the room watching too. So that's, that's a little odd. Uh, there's a lot of voyeurism in this show. The uh, next thing we see is she goes into the bathroom there and what's up with the bloody civil war guy <laughs> washing his hands in the sink. I love that you say that. Cause I, my, I even say very bloody dead guy in women's bathroom. That's what I'm saying. He's in the women's bathroom. <laughs> He's washing his hands in the sink, which ghosts don't need to wash no, their hands. It makes, He's covered in blood no. and he looks like a civil war guy. Yeah. If he was a Civil War guy, they wouldn't have had sinks. No. Right? I mean, well, they wouldn't have had. <laughs> Not okay. At I don't all. get that one at all. But anyway, he, he disappears. The ghost shows up in the bathroom, of course, because you can't get rid of a ghost. Uh, she says, Nobody can see me except you. And she says, Why? She says, Well, it's a gift I have. Well, if you were in my position, uh, don't you think you'd be pushy too? You know, because she's trying to get her to help her husband or whatever. Uh, she says, uh, My name's Hope Paulson. Uh, she asks her how long she's been dead. And then. She freaks out a little bit, the ghost does, because she can't see herself in the mirror. You can't tell me this is the first time. No, I mean, but... She's been dead for a bit. Yes, and, and this is, like, I had that same thought process because I wrote down, she knows she's dead, and for how long she's been dead. Yeah. She tells way too much information <laughs> that we don't need to know about, like, her age, why she died, when she died... She knew she was pregnant. Yeah, she says she's 26. Yeah, like she gave us everything. Instead of saying, she, she, okay, so she says that she thought everything was going to be fine. She she was told she had a, it's supposed to be atopic pre- pregnancy, right? She says like, yeah. I had an atopic pregnancy. I was like, what the, it's, yeah. it's, it's, pronounce it right. But she doesn't know that she, she, said, she I didn't can't know. see her reflection. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> she says she's 26. Uh, it wasn't supposed to happen to her. She was going to be a mommy. It's not fair. Okay, ghost. We all know it's not fair. Gotcha. <laughs> Um, she tells her about having, you know, the ability to help them cross over and all that stuff. Is this what you want? No. Uh, my husband hasn't been the same since he blames himself for what happened. That's why you have to help him. Uh, she says, have you been with him since? She says, yes, he doesn't sleep. He doesn't, (laughs) this is weird to me. He doesn't sleep or he does sleep. Um, he doesn't see his friends or his parents anymore. He hasn't read a book or gone camping. Yeah, and for that, <laughs> I put, camping. I, 
I even put, again, too much information about personal life. There's so much information. <laughs> I don't need to know about any of this, about your parents, his parents' sleeping no. schedule. I don't Mm-mm. need to know this. <laughs> sleeping schedule. But she says, um, you know, he's a wallower, and he's going to wallow in this for the rest of his life. Okay, lady, you just died. All right? I mean, let the dude wallow for a little bit or whatever. All right, so we're back in uh, Town Square, and Melinda is, said told the ghost she'd try to help, of course. Uh, and she's getting out of her car, and she's carrying, I wrote down, box o' junk going into antique store. Um, and then she runs in, she runs to this guy. This is the worst, like, B storyline I've ever seen in my life. Because she runs into this guy who's got an Australian accent, and he's really pushy. But they're kind of being flirty, you know. And then she holds up her ring and says, I'm married. And he's like, oh, that's too bad. Uh, Good luck in there. She drives a hard bargain because he's been coming out of, um, you know, dear God, this stuff is old, antique (laughs) shop. And so (laughs) she goes into the antique shop where she, quote, unquote, works. Uh, and then <laughs> she, uh, quote unquote owns. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. She's never there. Uh, Andrea asks how Jim is, which is very nice. Uh, she says he's fine. Um, uh, and then she, she calls him sexy, sensitive and indestructible. And she's got to get herself a man like that. What a, <laughs> anyway, uh, she says that the Australian guy came in, he's tall, he's hot, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that he had a 14 carat yellow gold oyster perpetual, uh, with matte dial, luminous Mercedes hands, center second sweep and screw down crown. So she just bought a watch from this dude. You want to know what my note was? Yeah. I put Andre, you bought watch from random guy outside. <laughs> Turns out it'd be fake. <laughs> That's right. It was a fake watch. <laughs> Uh, my favorite part is when Melinda says, oh, screw down crown, my favorite part. I just put weird. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say. But anyway, she gave the dude $1,100 for a damn fake watch. Melinda figures out it's fake, and she's like, oh, come on, no way. Again, the way they throw around mount, amounts of money in this show. Yeah. It just, it, I just gave the guy 1100 bucks in cash. Cash, number one. And uh, she's like, oh. Damn it. I didn't mean to. And the last show you paid 10 grand in her taxes or whatever, two shows ago. Yeah. I just yeah. wrote dumbass about beside her name. <laughs> uh, and why is the watch made in Vietnam? I thought that was a weird, random thing to say. I mean, my thing is if you're going to be working in an antique shop, shouldn't you know how to judge That's what if I'm something's saying, right? in an antique? Of course, I guess in her defense, she did just become a partner of this place. I, I don't know. Maybe she hadn't read all the books yet or something. Um, and she says, well, you know, the guy's probably going to be back. Um, she's, Andrea says, why would he be back? She says, well, he found a sucker he could sell to. I do love what that. What a weird, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind of rough. A, such a low blow. <laughs> to and why is it that Melinda, the whole time she's talking to her, has a tiny wooden hand in her hand? She's got this little wooden hand that she's just like doing this thing with. She and she's does. Like waving it. Yeah, she's waving it at Andrea. Noticed. I said, I said, why does she have a tiny wooden hand and what does she do? <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Bumble. So you want to find someone you're compatible with, specifically someone who's ready for a serious connection, totally open to having kids in the future, is a tall rock climbing Libra, and loves rom-coms with vegan pizzas on Tuesdays just as much as you do. Bumble knows that you know exactly what's right for you. So whatever it is you're looking for, Bumble's features can help you find it. Date now on Bumble. So, uh, basically, their, uh, their plan is wait for Aussie to come back, and then they're going to call the cops on him. Right? Yeah. So. Okay. Um, now we're outside in the town square where everything takes place, uh, and we're, she's sitting in front of Inniswell Realty, which uh, this dude runs, and I just wrote down, sad boy. Um, he is over there putting up house flyers, but very sadly. Um, and so she's talking to, um, 
him about being a good Samaritan. Uh, they talked about how long they were both married. Um, and she's having what I wrote down here is coffee in the park with sad boy. Um, because they're talking about how this happened with his wife. Right. Yeah. I got it. Here's a little aside. One of my biggest pet peeves, and I've seen a lot of TV and movies, but one of my biggest pet peeves is fake coffee in TV shows. That coffee cup didn't have a damn thing in it because it's so light and yet they put it up and they pretend to drink it or whatever. I understand that like in a live play or something, but in that, can you not put a little water in it or something just so it looks like they're actually drinking something? You know what I'm saying? It's what what would normally happen in a conversation, not just like pretend. Yeah, it's like it's an extra thing. They have to hold it up and actually drink from it. You know what I mean? It's I just I hate that. I don't know. I don't like that at all. All right. So he starts telling the story about how it was the Fourth of July. They were at a barbecue. They were having a fight. He doesn't even remember what it was about. Uh, but they were playing softball. Um, so she wanted to go home. Then we get another flashy flashback. Um, I I put down that sad boy is catching the softball. Um, and he talks about how uh, she wanted to go home. But he said, no, you know, I want to stay. I'm having so much fun. Then they show a picture of this poor girl, and she is so effing sweaty. She <laughs> she, she looks like she's about to die yeah. out there. And I, I just wrote down, she's so sweaty. Take her home. <laughs> <laughs> this poor girl's like, I don't feel good. Ah, you know, and he's like, oh, no, I like throwing balls. And so <laughs> they just stuck around and threw balls. So anyway, she ends up fainting. Uh, she passes out on the damn softball field where everybody wants to die. Uh, and then when they took her in, they found out that she was pregnant. But one of the things he says is, I thought it'd be a good story to tell the kid. <laughs> Again, I the word dumbass is next to this. <laughs> so. I I know. I was like listening. I was like, I need to watch this in the point of view of Mike. Oh, no. So you don't I, want that. I oh. was, when he said that, I was like, are you stupid? <laughs> That's what it says. It's like, a story to tell my kid. Remember when mommy died? That was fun. <laughs> so during this flashback, we see the doctor um, who uh, we find out some stuff about later. Uh, he tells her, tells him everything's going to be fine. And then it goes back to sad boy and he tells her how he thought it was all his fault. And he starts crying. Now the doctor is, is an old dude, but his name is Richard Hurd. Um, this guy I've seen in a ton of stuff. Like he was in all the president's men. He was in China syndrome. I mean, I know you don't know those movies, but well, he's rec- a very famous actor. I recognize the face, yeah. but I could never pinpoint where yeah. I recognize his face. He's been in face. a buttload of stuff. Yeah. I, he's probably dead at this point. But anyway, um, by the way, um, Jennifer Love Hewitt, if you want to call and tell us, uh, whether Richard Hurd is dead or not, uh, the number is two five four three hundred seven nine eight two. We'd love to talk to you about this episode or anything else. We are back at the hospital, um, and she's looking for her husband, Jim Clancy. I I love how the nurse knows exactly where he's at. Oh, CAT scan, room 133. That never happens, by the way. First of all, if you're a patient, don't you need somebody to discharge you unless, like, Well, he's getting a CAT scan. He's getting his CAT scan. (laughs) But, But he's in another room getting a CAT scan. Okay, whatever. Ghost, poof, there she is. Uh, sorry, have you talked to Brad? She says, yes. And she says, and, and he says, you two really loved each other. It, it, this whole thing about like, yeah, they loved each other. That's why she's sticking around. I mean, what, what's up with all the questions, right? The show could be 12 minutes. Um, they go into the stairwell to talk because I guess she doesn't want to be crazy in a hospital talking to the air. Um, and I wrote down the following words. All them ghosts looking down in stairwell stay away from the hospital because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they look up the stairwell and there's and like, like 400 ghosts yeah. looking down at them or whatever. It's just yeah. very creepy. And I, I didn't see, I didn't see any, um, uh, civil war ghosts no. in that. Did see some old nurses. Yes. With like the old red cross on their head mm-hmm. and stuff. I don't know why everybody's trapped in the clothes. <laughs> they die. My favorite thing though is once again, I bring this up 
I bring this up to attention. Why does this lady tell Melinda so much? I don't need this much information. No, you don't need all this information. She says, oh, I'm sorry. And she starts crying as they're talking, you know, because oh, that was Jim. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm a crier. I cry at the drop of that. Number one, ghost don't cry. Uh, just like my mother. I like to before I was pregnant. I just didn't know. It. So she knew she was pregnant. She didn't tell Brad. Uh, she knew it was going to be a little girl. One of the weirdest things she says is, I know when it when she was conceived. Okay, you. <laughs> um, <Yeah. And laughs> I think that's when I made that note. I was like, too much information. That is too much information, <laughs> yes. Like. yes. <laughs> so anyway, she tells them all that, and they look up, and they see all the ghosts. Uh, they leave the hospital, and at this point, Jim has one little tiny bandage on his head. He had this giant thing wrapped it's around like, his head before, yeah. and now it's just like, Doop. <laughs> oh, look, I bumped my head on the cabinet. So uh, they have a conversation. This is Melinda and Jim as they're leaving. Uh, he has an entire backpack full of stuff, by the way. I guess he changes a lot when he's at work. I don't know. Um, he says, uh, where were you? I don't. I guess during the CAT scan, he's saying? Yeah, because she... God knows you want somebody there during your CAT scan. Well, I don't know. I don't know I, where yeah. he's at question and where she was. Anyway. Um, oh, because she was talking to the... Uh, Dead lady in the yeah, stairs. Yeah, she was talking to dead girl in the stairs, yeah. but, I mean, he was getting a CAT scan. Why yeah. is he questioning where the hell she was? Anyway, they talk to, They go back and forth, and uh, he says, oh, you must be in hog heaven at the hospital because you get to see all the ghosts. What? Is she, what? Shut up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then she says, as she's helping him get in the car, helping him get in the car with his tiny bandage, she says, I'm happy that it's not you I'm helping. So basically what she just said is, I'm glad you're not dead. And he goes, oh, yeah, me too. Okay. All right, Jim, get in the car. Uh, <laughs> we're back at, and I did write it down, same as it never was, antiques. Uh, Andrea comes in carrying what I wrote down is a big old coffee. Um, and uh, she comes in and asks about Jim. She says he's safe and sound. Then the, uh, the, the Aussie crook comes in. And uh, Melinda's like, I got it, dummy. I'll handle it, <laughs> basically, is what yeah. she tells Andrea. Yeah. And so she goes up and says, how can I help you? Oh, how lucky am I? And then they start doing this weird flirting thing again, which it gets, it almost crosses a line because there's like sexy music playing and all this stuff. He puts a necklace around her neck. Um, he says, so how lucky am I? And she goes, yeah, I don't get out that much. And he goes, oh, that's a pity. And she goes, tisn't it? Tisn't. Is tisn't a word? In the script, it literally says T I S I N T. Tisn't. Tisn't it? <laughs> okay. Um, oh so, God. anyway, he's trying to basically con him again. He's got this European cut diamond and pearl necklace. Uh, it's antique art deco and platinum. Uh, and he puts it around and she, she says, Oh, great. Uh, and he's asking 2800 bucks for it. Uh, she says, I tell you what, why don't you give me my $1,100 back, you filthy crook. And he says, well, how do I know that you didn't swap the watch out with another one? Which I just wrote down. Um, I mean, good point. He's got a good point, that, right? Valid point. And so he leaves. And then Andrea says, and how did that go? And again, she got a good point. Yeah. Because Melinda was like, <laughs> screw you, I'll do this. you know. And then yeah. she screws up. Okay, so uh, we're at uh, Melinda's house, and they're eating this this pasta with cheese that you can only get from Bianchi's. And she says to Jim, "It's better with cheese." What does it taste like? Garbage? <laughs> if you put cheese on it, it's a lot better. Just cover it with cheese. <laughs> anyway, it's a special cheese that Jim loves, and she got it for him because he's home, I guess. Uh, they start talking about free will versus fate and destiny and all this stuff. Uh, she says, you know, I choose to love you. It affects my destiny or whatever. They talk about that for a while. That comes in a little later. Uh, they talk about accidents, and then Jim gets all mopey and sad and says, you know, it was, uh, I cost somebody their life, and accidents happen, but there's you know, whatever. Okay, so now we got sad Jim. Yeah, <laughs> it's... Now, it's the next morning, uh, and he's he's leaving, but he doesn't have to be in for two hours, or she doesn't have to be in for two hours. Um, and But they're going in early, and she tells him that she's working on Hope Paulson. He asks, oh, is that related to Brad Paulson? 
uh, and says it's his wife. And then, okay, so this is where he finds out that, you know, she's trying to save her by talking to Brad and all this stuff. Um, and then Jim mentions Derek Lee, who was there during Hope's surgery, uh, which has Derek come up before? Oh, because Brad mentioned a male nurse that was in there yes. during the thing. Yes. Yeah. And so they find out it's Derek Lee. It's funny to me that Jim always knows all of the medical stuff no matter what. He's a freaking EMT. I mean, they don't, it's not like they're in the inner workings of the no. hospital or anything. They, like, he should not know. Yeah. Like, okay. And so then Melinda says, you realize that all this started with you making me French toast, which I don't, is that the sexy playtime they had? I don't know, because he brought it up in the scene before. Yeah. Where... It's like, oh, I was late to work. And oh, that's blah, right. Blah, blah, because he because was late because she made French toast. French toast. Or whatever. And he always it. checks okay. everything okay. on the blah, blah, blah. And if he hadn't been late, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Blah, blah. Okay. Gotcha. 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 All right. Okay. That, that's how much I paid attention. Uh, so now um, we're in front of a house that uh, the sad mopey boy is selling. Uh, and dead girl is sitting on the car hood because that's a thing. Uh, and sad boy is hammering a sign into the grass, uh, asking about, uh, if he wants to buy a house or whatever. Melinda is there. She says, uh, the ghost says to her, he does this every day, hammers a sign into the ground then pulls it up before he goes to work, which seems like a really weird exercise. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, asks about moving and they go back and forth. Um, she, this is where in the show, she always tells the living person that, oh my yeah. God, I can see your insert name of relative here um i have brad mad at melinda for telling him she sees the dead wow who would have guessed that one <laughs> no, she, it was seven <laughs> episodes in and we already know like every single one somebody's gonna be mad at her or whatever uh so the dead girl's watching the one note i did write down is that the wind is going through her hair which that's not gonna happen if she's a ghost but okay um, he says, you know how many houses I've sold since my wife has been dead? Exactly Zero. none. And I wrote down, how does he live? How does, how does he make money? Is he just, is he just in financial ruin at this point? Is, is today July 7th and she died on the 4th? I, I don't even know. I don't know how this works. So, uh, he says he went to a, a, a therapist and they charged him 5,500 bucks to tell him everything was fine and blah, blah, blah. So he storms off, same scene we see from every show. Uh, now we're back at the hospital cafeteria. She's tracking down Derek Lee. Poor dude's just trying to eat. Yeah. She comes up and goes, hi, can I sit with you? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. I, I guess he thinks he's getting you're lucky. I don't know. Um, but he just lets this random lady sit down with him, and then she starts talking about dead girls and stuff. Uh, and he's like, uh, no, I don't want to do this. Uh, he takes off. Um, the dead girl, of course, is there the whole freaking time, very close to her, yes. listening to this whole conversation. Um, he leaves, and she chases him up the hospital stairs, and then they run into the doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. This is Dr. Gore. No, I mean, Dr. Devine. Dr. Devine. <laughs> Dumb name. <laughs> so uh, they, they meet each other, and dead girl says, oh, that's the dude that operated on me. So even the dead girl doesn't know what happened here at this point, right? Um, and so they meet the doctor and then they, they explain, they uh, exchange pleasantries. And, um, then, uh, Derek like rolls his eyes and says, all right, whatever. And goes into the stairwell with Melinda and he's going to tell her some secrets. I just wrote well, secrets in the stairwell. I put, she meets doc that operated on dead wife. Now nurse is willing to help. Nurse gets mad at Melinda. He thinks he, he's a big man. <laughs> <laughs> Nurse tells Melinda to meet him in a very creepy archive basement in the hospital. Yes, yes. He says, he says, I get off at four. Meet me in the hospital archives. What? Okay. So I guess, I mean, so I, I guess creepy. we find out, but it is creepy as hell, it's right? It's very creepy. And, very and creepy. by the way, the dead girls are the whole freaking time. So the next scene we see is now we're at a flea market, which this isn't a flea market. It's a garage sale. And it looks like the sign was made by a three-year-old, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And it's crooked. Like, oh, look at this goofy little thing they're at. It's so fun. 
Anyway, uh, Andrea sees the Aussie there. He's shopping, and they talk about uh, how he's found some books or something. I don't. It's whatever. Uh, they end up making a making a date with each other, right? And so they're going to go to dinner. Great. Like I said, terrible B story. Uh, now we're outside the or we're at the hospital again. Uh, Melinda is going into the hospital archives. And by the way, Melinda, you took a wrong turn at Albuquerque or something because you're in the freaking morgue. <laughs> yeah, dude. So, <laughs> I put, and the and the dead guy just comes rolling out yeah. of one of the drawers. So, I put Melinda goes to the bottom of the hospital hospital with the nurse. It gives me creepy vibes, and she sees dead dude from the ambulance wreck. And she screams like a little baby. She does. And and it, but what I wrote down is um, that when when Derek comes in, he pushes the dead body back in. I just put bad hinges on dead drawers or something because those freaking doors, they just open and people just slide out every once in a while. That's, that's a bad it's, thing for dead bodies. Yes. So they are in the archives and they're looking through files and stuff. And he's telling her all about how this doctor did the wrong thing. He uh, closed without suturing the backside of the fallopian tube, and she bled out, and that's what killed Hope. Uh, and then he shows a video of this happening, and uh, he said he tried to say something, but this damn doctor's been there for 30 years or whatever. I think there's a little racism involved. But uh, she opens the file and finds a little note that says Brad on it, and I just wrote down she stole the note because she just takes it out of the file, right, and sticks it in her pocket. Well, she did ask. Oh, did she ask? Yeah, she did ask if she could take it. Oh, she does say, she says, can I keep this? And And he goes, yeah, why not? This case is dead and buried. Okay. All right. I got it. I missed that part. I'm so sorry. Uh, Making a thief out of poor Melinda. Yeah, I don't care. She, uh, I tell you what, Jennifer Love Hewitt, if you would like to uh, correct any of these things that I said, you can call us at 254-300-7982 or come see us at 1129 Webster Avenue. That would be a trip. Uh, or send us an email at info at roguemedianetwork.com. We would love to talk to you. Okay, so now uh, we're on the date with the Aussie and Andrea, um, and um, they're at Lambs on the Square. I'm just taking a moment to take all that in. They're at Lambs on the Square. This chef comes out of the door with, like, some big plate of something that she's taken to the people. And she's got such dark shades on. I said, why is the chef blind? It looks like the damn chef it's, is blind. And th- this has to And be, it's at night. It's at night. And she's wearing she's shades. She's wearing sunglasses. All right. So she's on a, uh, she's on a date with this Aussie guy, and, which I think she's doing it just to try to get, get the money back or whatever. Yes. We find out here in a second. And we also, did we know that Andrea was an assistant DA in New York? She says that at one she, point. Yeah, she says it. I don't know if she's. Oh, I guess maybe she quit that because of the rat race, and she came back for oh. a simpler life. Or what? Okay, yeah, all right, yeah. Never mind. All right, just oof, whatever. Um, so they're talking, and then the poor waiter comes up and says, uh, "Hey, can I get you guys anything? Or would you like to hear the specials?" And then Andrea picks that moment to lay into the guy and say, "Give me my money back, or I'm going to call the cops, or whatever." Right? Yeah. And the poor waiter has to stand there the whole time and just like listen yeah. to it. And he's like, "Hey, uh, I can come back if I need to, or whatever." And she's like, "Don't bother." This dude didn't do anything. He's just trying to do his job, by the way. And she gets up and she pats him on the face. Why is she? It's so condescending to this poor waiter. Anyway, that was yeah. something I had a real problem with. Next thing we see uh, is the doctor leaving his house because Melinda is outside stalking him. Uh, and his wife says, I love you. Drive carefully. I'll see you tonight. I knew she was a friggin' ghost. She had to be a ghost, right? Yeah. Because there's got to be something wrong with this doctor. Yeah. Right? So no, she's a yeah. damn ghost. We don't find that out for a few minutes. Spoiler alert. Um, then uh, Melinda comes up to the house and just walks the hell in. I mean, she does She does knock, and then you hear, come in. But she just walks in. So this guy leaves. I, okay. So he's got early onset dementia, we find out, right? Yes. I don't think it's that early, by the way. Number one, he's pretty old. Um, I mean, old enough. And then he just doesn't lock his door? Is that how things work? Yes. Okay. All right. Got to leave the door up for the ghost, just in case. Um, so... <laughs> 
Uh, she ends up talking to uh, Miss Divine, uh, and she tells her that her husband has an illness, only uh, early onset dementia. Uh, she was in denial. Um, he still is. Uh, they look at these little cards she made for him. One of them just says oven. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, but anyway, the, the ghost has been praying for somebody to come help, and this might be it. And she says, uh, well, I think my husband, referring to Jim, uh, might say it's fate because of that conversation they had. And she goes, fate or not, mine won't go gently, talking about the dumb doctor. <laughs> and so she says that she'll be there to hold his hand. And she says, yes, she will. Well, no, you won't because you're a ghost. You can't hold his hand, but whatever. Uh, we're, uh. Back, we're, ba- <laughs> we're back in town square. We're now sitting in the park with the ghost. Uh, and she has to tell her that Dr. Devine's losing his mind, which kind of rhymes. Um, and then, uh, losing his mind would be a blessing. It's deteriorating slowly. Okay, Melinda, we get it. Yeah, whatever. Uh, anyway, so we find out that the doctor made a mistake. That's why, uh, dead girl is dead. Uh, yeah. and then Melinda says, I'm sorry, twice in a row for some reason. And then we are still in the park, but we're next to an army statue all of a sudden that I've never seen. So this comes back. Oh, sure. It does. And well, no, because they mentioned it in one of the earlier episodes. They mentioned the army statue? Yes, because remember. Maybe this is where dead guy washing his hands came from. No, but remember when uh, soldiers, yeah. the soldier. Yeah, and, that was the first one. The fir- yeah, so. Yeah. That's where that statue comes into play oh. because it's all the names of the people that fought in the Vietnam War that came from that town. Why would you put quotes around Vietnam War? Like, are you a Vietnam War? Did, no, but that you don't think it really happened or something? No, because it's like, <laughs> dude, this whole show's fake. It's, it's like it's a bunch of fake people's names on the statue. Yeah, but even though it's, it's fake, I mean, Vietnam War still happened. So <laughs> why are you oh putting quotes my. around that? Because the All right, Vietnam Allison, we War see how it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I don't need to know about your political beliefs. Uh, anyway, oh. we're now <laughs> we're now sitting there with the dead girl and the the husband. Uh, he still doesn't know she's there. Uh, they talk about how um, it was a mistake and the doctor's sick and all this stuff. And then Melinda has the note to read to Brad. Uh, and it goes a little something like this, Brad, I know you feel like this is your fault, but I want you to know, I don't blame you at a certain point. Melinda stops reading and the dead girl takes over saying it. Uh, you've always taken better care of me than I have myself from the day that I laid eyes on you in detention. (laughs) And that hasn't changed today. I never felt more in love with you. You're dead. (laughs) Then when I watched you all worried and sweaty and caring, worn and run beside this gurney when they wheeled me in here. So please don't wallow. Oh, and if I'm not awake when you get back, don't forget to feed Daisy and walk her. See you tomorrow. Well, if you're not going to be awake tomorrow, why would you say see you tomorrow? I don't know. Anyway, feed the damn dog. <laughs> um, so she's crying. You know, she whispers thank you or whatever. And then they walk off, and she's got her arm around him, which is weird because I wrote, how is she holding him? Because, um, again, she's a ghost. I, I, I just need I just need them to set down the rules for me and then follow them. That's all, right? They keep breaking their own damn rules here about ghosts. <laughs> By the way, Jennifer Love Hewitt, if you could explain that to me and call us, it's 254-300-7982, or you could write us a note at info at roguemedianetwork.com. We'd I, really appreciate it. I put down, dead ghost goes bye-bye. <laughs> dead ghost goes bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, so she crosses over, yeah. right? Now we're in the doctor's office. Now she's got to solve this other thing. So there's three real stories to this thing, right? Yes. One guy's got dementia. Other girl, is, she got sweaty and died on a baseball field. And then uh, there's there's... The Aussie guy with a watch, which is... Again, ooh, all this, whatever. like, at least two different episodes between Crazy yes. Doctor and... Yes, Please show me shorter episodes <laughs> where, you know, this is 15 minutes, guy's got dementia. Oh, shit. Uh, ladies here. <laughs> okay, great. All right, solved. Uh, so, <clears throat> we're in the doctor's office. She's saying, I know how it is. I know you got uh, dementia. He's like, what? Well, he's got dementia. Um, and then his wife shows up and tells him a proverb. And so yeah. she quotes it back to him. And then he goes, oh, my God, okay. And then nothing really happens. So I guess no. he quit. I don't know. Because my notes just say, 
Because I don't mean to be. No, I don't, it, I don't it, mean to be insensitive, but is he going to remember this? It doesn't address any of it. I literally in my notes put his wife dead. That's why she stays. She says he got to go. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I put, he confused on how Melinda knows this, that his <laughs> wife is dead, and the quote from Proverbs. And then that's it. That's all my notes that's recording it. I don't know what happens like to the damn doctor. He may have <laughs> killed another 50 people after this. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think you probably need to tell the hospital. So <laughs> anyway, we're back at the store, and uh, Andrea says that she got the money back from the Australian. Yay. Uh, and then we're at home at night with Andrea. I mean, with, uh, Melinda and Jim, Jim's out on the porch. Andrea, I, Jesus, <laughs> Melinda comes out all wet. I guess she's taking a shower or she's falling in the sink or something. <laughs> uh, and then we get this wrap up story that feels like it was, it was made in like 12 seconds. But what I don't understand is this whole time. I don't it's understand on, any of it. <laughs> it's on the front porch. Yeah. Melinda shows up outside wet. on her front porch in her bathrobe. Super wet. Super wet. Yep. Why? I don't know. She's Why? I can understand if it's your backyard because you know spirit. it's fenced. I don't know. But your front? Yeah, she's showing her front. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> anyway, Jim wraps this whole thing up and says, turns out he was re- the, the guy that died in the uh, ambulance. ambulance that rolled out of the thing, started rotting in the middle of the, the archives, right? He rolled yeah. out of the thing. Uh, he was he had just gotten out of prison. Uh, he was doing seven years for attempted murder. Uh, he told his cellmate that when he got out, he was going to find his, quote-unquote, old lady and fix her for good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was two miles from her house when he crashed the motorcycle, so if he hadn't picked him up or if he might have recovered, he might have gone back and killed his wife. But everything's great now, so it's all over. I just wrote down, Jesus. So, <laughs> um, little spoiler for you: don't do it. His that uh, dead guy story doesn't end. Well, no shit, because at the end, when yeah. everything's great and they say, "Well, it must have been the French toast," then you see dead guy outside watching their house as they go have sexy time and yeah. turn their light off. Yeah, I put oh. they go inside. Dot dot dot. Gross. Dead guy outside. <laughs> Watching. Yeah, <laughs> gross. <laughs> yep, pretty much. That's the way it was. I well, you got to get rid of that whipped cream somehow, you know. <laughs> so no. <laughs> all right. Well, that is another episode of Ghost Whisperer. That was all done for you, Jennifer Love Hewitt. If you could please call us uh, and let us know how we did at two five four three hundred seven nine eight two. We're located at eleven twenty nine Webster Avenue in Waco, Texas, where you were born. Uh, or you can drop us a note. Uh, I don't think you were born at eleven twenty nine Webster, but still. <laughs> Uh, we're at info at roguemedianetwork.com. Jennifer Love Hewitt, please be on our show. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Can't wait till next week. Can't wait till next week. Boy, oh boy. I'm starting to psych myself <laughs> up now. <laughs> Look at Mason. He's got two <laughs> thumbs up over here. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, we've got a lot of other shows at roguemedianetwork.com. Please check them out and we'll see you next time. has been a Rogue Media Podcast.